All right, David, kick us off. All right, everyone, welcome to lecture seven of DAV. We're gonna be talking about the microphones today. Thank you all for joining the end. Oh, wait, yeah, I thought this was your thing. Yeah, 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 sorry. Uh, we're gonna start out with a little bit of where in the world. So uh, for this one, this is a very special one. You probably have seen this place, but to get this where in the world, right, you have to actually name the specific building that this is. So have fun with that. It's kind of yeah. flexing on, on people who haven't been though. If you have never been to campus, good luck. All the North Campus majors are, or all the North Campus people are just like shouty up in arms right now. Sad, I haven't been to campus. Next year, next year, knock on wood. All right, Bryson, I'll take you on a tour next year personally to this specific building. I know someone who wants to run for events coordinator who says in addition to the IEEE lab social at the beginning of the year, it should be like a campus tour thing. I think it'd be a good idea. I, I probably appreciate. wasn't supposed to, I probably wasn't supposed to reveal that, but. And now it's going on YouTube. <laughs> You're feeding the competition. <laughs> My bad. Better warn them. Brandon, right. is this your favorite spot on campus? No, it is not. We all know my favorite spot on campus. The one and only IEEE lab. Mm. Yeah, we do like 20 seconds, I think. Do, 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 do. All right, if you haven't answered, you should put something in right now. All right, I think that's it. Drum roll, please. The answer was Rolf Hall on North Campus. So that's our where in the world for today. All right, and with that, we're going into announcements, David. All right, announcements. Everyone, welcome back to school. I hope you had a good week of break. Hopefully it was enough. Uh, a lot of things going on at Triple E in the spring quarter. Uh, first off, there's the intro to Linux commands workshop, which is happening Thursday, week three. It's next week at 6 p.m. Highly recommend, I have it. Um, from good sources that the, this workshop was handmade for the IEEE public. So you don't want to miss this. Following that is a serial communication workshop. That's week five Thursday. That should be um, really exciting as well. Then um, after that, executive board elections happen Monday, week three at 6.30 p.m. If you're not um, already registered to vote, you should do that soon I think by Sunday I think it is and uh, come out to the elections on Monday week three admin board elections that's Monday week four at 6 30 p.m but if you want to run for an admin position the apps are due Saturday week three and if you want to run for a projects board for example if you want to be the dab lead um, the apps are due Thursday week four and uh, the leads will get back to you to schedule an interview uh, after that uh, social wise, we're going to have an alumni board game night tomorrow night at 7 p.m. Come out. It'll be really fun. Hopefully uh, you'll get to talk to the alumni, see what they get up to. Um, and after that, this Sunday, there's an IEEE movie night hosted by our very own president and internal vice president, Brian and Kathy. We're going to be watching Ryan the Last Dragon. So come out to the movie night and uh, hopefully it'll be, it'll be a good time. 
I can confirm that Ryan the Last Dragon is a pretty decent movie. So. Dude, that's spoiler. All right. What if it was terrible? Oh, well, yeah, my bad. All right. <laughs> so, using the, obviously, we are now going to talk about using the microphones, which is the last part of DAV. Uh, the last part that you actually need. You've gotten through the, pro, the, the FFT, you've gotten through the VGA. So now, what's the most important part about seeing sounds on screen? Sounds. So with that, David, take it away. Oh, thank you. Um, OK, so in the boxes we sent out, we included two types of microphones, an analog microphone and a digital microphone. And uh, we, we soldered the headers ourselves and like we tested them. But if like they somehow got loose uh, during shipping or something, or we did a bad job, you can just like solder them on uh, yourself and just like touch them up. And so uh, the important thing to know about these microphones is that the FPGA only accepts digital inputs, which are like zeros and ones. So whatever you feed into the, to the FPGA has to be in a digital format. And so we're going to see how we do that with both microphones. Uh, so the first type is our analog microphone. And it's pretty simple. It has basically two components, which is a transducer and an amplifier. Uh, just think of the transducer as like a capacitor that has a variable capacitance, which changes based on the input. And that change in capacitance basically records uh, the audio level. And the amplifier is exactly what it says on the box. It amplifies the signal uh, to the output. And so the analog microphone, uh, it's analog because it gives you an analog output. Unfortunately, you can't feed that directly into the, F into the F FPGA. So uh, in order to fix that problem, you need, we need to use an analog to digital converter. And that basically converts analog signals to digital signals. Uh, so if you see on the graph on the bottom left there, actually, no, on the bottom right instead. So the top figure is like your analog signal. It's like very wavy, continuous. And the analog to digital converter converts all those values into discrete values. And that's what you get on the bottom, uh, the bottom picture. And if you go back to the left, you can see um, that straight line is your analog signal. But once you convert it to additional value, you have to pick like either one or the other. You know, you can't have in-between values, it has to be discrete. Um, so one thing you should know when you use an ADC is that they necessarily introduce a little bit of noise because uh, once you have uh, an analog value that's kind of in between uh, your discrete values, uh, I mean, this, the, the converter has to pick one or the other, right? And that'll you know, introduce a little bit of error. Uh, luckily, there's an ADC on board the FPGA. So we don't actually have to you know, go through the hassle of like picking one and looking at the specs for those. Uh, so we're just gonna be using uh, that. And we'll explain how to use the ADC uh, on the spec. All right, so then after that, you've got your analog microphone, but you also have your digital microphone that we sent out. And so the uh, digital microphone, obviously in the name, will actually uh, transmit data in a digital format. And so on board, you have the ADC in the microphone itself. And then you also have um, a filter that kind of helps with reducing the noise that kind of happens already from ADC conversion. And then after it, uh, the signal passes through that filter, it gets converted into this I squared S serial format, um, which is the basic protocol that we're going to use for this microphone to get data from it. And so I squared S uses a clock, a word clock and an output, which we will explain right now. So yeah, I squared S um, kind of if you're it's very similar to something you might know of I squared C if you've done previous projects like Aircopter or Micromass, it's another communication protocol for digital information. And so there's a serial clock, which is basically the, uh, the base clock for timing the entire microphone, which will come from the internal system clock that you get off of your FPGA. So you'll be basically feeding that clock and outputting that to your microphone. 
And then there's also a word select clock, which basically there are two channels for the microphone to transmit on, the left and the right, or zero and one. And so every 32 bits or so, you flip this word clock and um, basically switch the channels. And then there's a serial data, uh, the out, um, output, which comes from the microphone. And this is the actual data stream. It's a series of zeros and ones. And you'll see a timing diagram of how this works right now. So you see here a serial clock, which could also be called B clock on our microphone. And so on the negative edge of the clock, you see um, bits of data come in. And you also see the word select um, changing. So on the neg uh, negative edge of the clock, you can change your word select, which will change the channel. And so right at this point, you'll be you'll have received your last LS your last bit from one channel. And then you'll start receiving the most significant bit from the next channel. And you receive, say, 32 bits typically for a 32 bit process. And then you on at, after receiving 32 bits, you change LR clock. And then on the next negative edge of the serial clock, you get uh, the most significant bit from your next channel. And this is just repeated over and over and over again. Any questions there? Nope. Okay. So then there's this great chart that you can look at later on the slides, but there, here are some kind of basic points between the pros and cons of analog and digital microphones. So analog, as David said, it's more faithful to the original signal because it's basically just the raw data and it's also more customizable and it's smaller and less complicated in the microphone. But the digital microphone is less susceptible to noise and it's less hassle to have to use an ADC converter. Uh, so there's pros and cons to each. And now with that, we're going to move on to a next topic that we're going to use specifically for this lab, filtering. So what is filtering? You know, in LA, you probably drink, have to drink water as a human being. And, you know, sometimes you get that water straight out of the tap, but sometimes you don't want to drink the water straight out of the tap. You think it's probably going to be nasty. So what do you use? You use a Brita filter and a Brita filter gets all that nasty stuff out of your water and purifies it. So an electrical filter um, takes out all the disgusting, noisy parts of electrical signals. Um, and these could be designed so that they have, they cut off high frequencies, they cut off low frequencies, they cut off a middle frequency. And basically you can design filters to get rid of exactly what you want. So there are some reasons why you want to get different parts of signals removed. So you could have a high pass filter, which basically as the name uh, implies, it lets the higher frequencies pass through and removes lower frequencies like the hum of an air conditioner or uh, the basic noise of someone walking on a floorboard. Or you could have a low pass filter which removes higher frequencies and higher frequencies tend to be kind of random jittery noise um, that you don't want to care, you don't care about perhaps in like speech processing. And then there's other types of filtering um, such as a derivative filter which typically is used for enhancing edges and boundaries, especially in images and spatial fi filtering. So why do we care about that? Well, we're going to be using some examples of filtering in, uh, in this lab. So we're going to be using specifically a low pass and a high pass filter. But you know, if you wanna play around sometime in the future, you could do a band pass or a band uh, notch, band reject, that's the word. And so here's a few implementation ideas of a low pass and a high pass that you can commonly find on the internet. It's basically the pseudocode for how you get your output from your input. So you can see in an example for a low pass, you take Y of K, which is your output at this moment in time. And you basically take your output from the previous sample and you multiply it by some constant. And then you also take your input at this moment in time and multiply by one minus that constant. And so basically you're scaling your previous output and your, your previous uh, filtered output and your input at this point in time and using that as your low pass filter. And it's kind of a similar process with high pass, just with a extra step. 
So we'll talk about, we'll kind of go into more detail on that in the spec and also link these links for you to read if you're interested. All right. Any, Any questions, questions there? Okay. If no questions, we're going to talk about windowing. This is like not explicitly in the lab, but I think it's cool. And I think it's something you should know. So I'm going to talk about it. And so um, the rationale behind windowing is because there are some problems that arise when you're using FFT. And if you remember way back to lecture four, when we first talked about the FFT, uh, we talked about how the FFT really likes to have periodic signals. Uh, but the thing is, since we're using like a finite number of samples, like our sample is like a finite length, uh, we might not be using an integer number of periods. And so that's a problem because when you kind of stitch them together, uh, you, you might have like some sharp uh, discontinuities between the signals, uh, between like each sample, and that will cause uh, the frequencies to kind of leak into neighboring ones. So for an example of what I mean, uh, we have an example here. Let's say you are measuring like a cosine, right? And you have this cosine and you measure exactly two full periods, right? So when you stitch things, to, when you stitch them together into the FFT, you get this, which, you know, looks, looks great. You know, it's a cosine, great. And um, so you don't have any discontinuities here. And so this is fine. And uh, let's say you decided instead to uh, measure for a slightly longer amount of time. So um, you measure for this amount of time. And it's a little longer, right? It's a little more than two periods. And you'll see that if you try to stitch this signal with itself and it repeats, you get this sharp discontinuity there that it, it doesn't exist in the actual original signal, but it only appeared because we were sampling for a finite amount of time, right? And this is gonna cause the FFT to give kind of an um, inaccurate, uh, an inaccurate output as to what the frequency actually is, be, be just really only because of this uh, discontinuity. And so if you look at the output of the um, FFT with this this perfectly periodic signal, you get just this one um, this one delta at this one frequency, right? Works great. But if you go to the one with this with this continuity, you get what we call it is leakage, where um, the main frequency is represented, but the FFT thinks that there's frequencies of a lot of um, in a lot of neighboring ones, in a lot of uh, neighboring frequencies. So this is what we call, well, this is what we say is, uh, sorry, we say this is, we say, we say power has leaked out of the main frequency and it has gone to the neighboring ones. And this is a problem because, you know, like those frequencies don't actually exist, but it, they only appeared because of that, uh, that sharp discontinuity. Um, so what can we do? Uh, we use what we call windows which kind of reduces the impact of discontinuities at the boundaries. So the window varies very smoothly and it approaches zero at the boundaries of the signal, which helps uh, reduce that impact. So to actually apply the window, all you do is multiply the time signal uh, by your window. So you can see the time signal here is that gray wave and the window is the blue and the yellow. And so, um, you can see that um, if you go on Windows Blue, time signal, uh, if you go on, um, now the endpoints of the wave meet, and this, you know, this makes it so that the, the discontinuity is not as obvious. And you can see here that um, the frequencies around the original main frequency are more, um, more obvious, and the amount of power in the neighboring ones is much lower. So it's a lot easier to tell what the frequency, what, what the frequencies actually should be. And for a kind of side-by-side -side comparison, you can have the first one is the original perfectly periodic frequency. The second one is the one with discontinuity. And the third is with the window applied. 
Um, so you can see with the window applied, uh, especially around the mean frequency, it's a lot more uh, pronounced and your result will generally be much better because you don't have these kind of weird uh, side frequencies messing up your result. Yeah, so you can see this kind of uh, lobe, this main lobe is a little more obvious. And what I mean by main lobe, uh, I'll give with this example. Uh, so we have two of the most common types of windows here, the Hamming window and the Hanning window, unfortunately named. So we'll call them the red one, the red window and the blue window. Uh, once you apply these two windows to the signal, you get uh, the picture on the right. So you can see with the blue window, the Hamming window, uh, the lobe around the main frequency in the middle is narrower than the red one. And so um, that's generally better because it means that more uh, the power around the main frequency is more concentrated. But, uh, but in return, the power on the side frequencies, the mean, uh, is much higher. So you can see the blue lines, uh, especially on the sides, are much higher uh, than the ones and the red ones. So this is generally what we call the trade off between uh, main lobes and side lobes. Usually, if you want to have a narrow, narrower main lobe, which means that you want to have um, a more pronounced main frequency, it means that you have higher side lobes as well. And so, the, and so uh, you can see for the red one, if you have a wider main lobe, uh, you have uh, smaller side lobes, which is you know, you, which is the trade-off, I guess. And um, okay. Any questions about that? All right. All right, so if there's no questions on that, we're going to actually tell you how you see sounds on screen with the screen because you did Flappy Bird, FPG Happy Bird, but you know, that's it's kind of different from a DAV like project, so. We're go in this lab, we're going to do something very similar to DAV, but not quite DAV yet. We're going to take out the FFT for a, a small moment. And we're just going to do this microphone to FPGA filter to monitor um, block diagram. And so this filter, we're going, we're kind of, we're going to give you the main code as to how the filter works. But then after that, um, you, you will be implementing the actual filter types though, but we'll give you how the filter processor works, you'll be designing the microphone and then, or the microphone signals between the two. And then uh, also the last part, doing the monitoring. So in FPG Happy Bird, with the VGA signals, we were more concerned of how you did H-Sync and V-Sync. And remember, we kind of said, oh, we'll give you these variables and we'll tell you if, if these variables are high, just set it to red. If it's low, set it to blue. Well, it's a little more complicated now because what you're going to get from your microphone and when, from your filter is going to be um, a set of values ranging from zero to 4,095. And you have to decide, well, if I'm at this current point on my display, how am I supposed to know if I am black or red just based off this number? And so um, you kind of have to think about it on the fly. So what do we do? So basically we're going to sample um, one value for each uh, horizontal pixel and then map that to a vertical space on the VGA monitor and just do that one at a time. So uh, your microphone is going to give you a value from zero to 4,095, and you need to map that um, to a value uh, from 0 to 480, because obviously the VJ, as we have talked about, is 480 vertical pixels. Now, the problem with that is that um, VGA, 0, 0 is in the top left. So your vertical pixels increase as the screen goes down, but your microphone increases upwards. So if you just straight, if you simply go, um, let's say 4,095 equals 480, zero equals zero, you're going to get your signal upside down, which is not good. So we have to flip it by doing sign multiplication um, and then kind of using ratios to 
uh, squeeze it down from 0 to 4,095 to 0, 0,480, and then simply add or subtract to kind of move it up or down the screen. So any questions there? We'll explain it also in the spec. No, no questions. All right. Well, I guess that is the end of that. So um, this is how I feel, you know, about lab seven, one of your last labs. Um, it will be due Sunday of week four. It'll basically be doing signal filtering and you'll pretty much see almost sounds on screen. And then after that, you will, you'll take everything you've learned. You'll take the microphone, you'll take the monitor, You'll take the FFT, you're gonna put together DAV and we're gonna do like a tiered competition of your achievements and you may win some cool prizes based off what you accomplish. So, you know, stay tuned for that, get hyped. This lab will have about four checkpoints, but you know, two deadlines. Um, and uh, other than that, if you're interested in being DAV lead, you know, come talk to us. Or if you're interested in being any other type of uh, officer, go ahead, talk to us, talk to other officers. We'd be happy to give you information that we know. With that, lecture is over. I will stop the recording. <laughs>